Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Spirits and Ghost Stories. We're your host, Carly Bird. And I'm Thomas Ernst. So, today is December 1st, the day that we're airing the show. Week. It will be week 18 by the time this episode is released, which will be tomorrow, December 2nd. Guys, for all of our Americans out there, happy Thanksgiving. I hope it was really good. I deeply apologize that we missed one week. Um... This is our first time doing this. Hope you didn't the, miss us. We don't know the analytics of like, guess what? You need to release your podcast on Thanksgiving if your podcast drops on the Thursday. Nah, we had too many different houses to visit in one day. Oh my God. It was, it was crazy. Not doable for us. But, so hopefully it doesn't mess it up. We're going to be back to a regular schedule. And we have some interesting like new news before we get kind of get into the episode today because it's a really good one. Number one, are going to try to change up some of the content presentation a little bit just to see if it's some, something you guys like. Uh, we are going to actually go with call-in shows for the <gasps> first time. We're going to try Call-in shows? Mm-hmm. I don't even know how to make that work. We have a couple of people actually lined up that actually want to call in with their ghost stories. <laughs> so I thought it would be a good idea to basically leave it up to you guys because this is, this is a democracy. Is it? Is. It? it is. So... If you like it, we'll know because the numbers will tell us that you like it. Yeah. And the emails will tell us that you like it. Yeah. So we'll continue to do it. If okay. literally no one listens to the show and they call in with a bunch of swear words about me or you, then we'll know not to do it anymore. The True. point is, I want to evolve. I want to try a bunch of different avenues. Absolutely. Number two. Number two. Uh-oh. What happens in three weeks, Miss Bird? <gasps> Dun, 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 Christmas! So, we, <laughs> <laughs> at least for a couple of episodes, want to try to do some cultural, historical, and spooky Christmas stories and or holiday folklore hanukkah yes all of that shit and other religious <laughs> times <laughs> hanukkah tommy what are we drinking tonight we are drinking tequila with cinnamon syrup and cinnamon sticks now you might be saying where's the cinnamon sticks well we're poor and we cannot buy cinnamon sticks so tequila and cinnamon syrup and it's called divine intervention which is a fantastic drink title for the story that we're going to be presenting tonight oh really tell me about it in the comment section i'll get more people (laughs) so (laughs) so i had somebody reach out to me on social media saying I am so glad they let you speak words <laughs> on YouTube and a podcast because I have a, a speech impediment and you give me pride that I can shoot for the dreams. And here's the thing. I am really glad <laughs> that I inspire you on the same token. Damn. I mean, a compliment. Take it as a compliment. Also, if you want to, I guess, really emphasize something, just talk really slow. So, fun fact, before we're getting into the show today, she actually reads off a script for a living. I do not. <laughs> and I do not read off a script she for does. a living. What do you do for a living? I interpret. Yes, so you're good at fucking reading. Sign language. Can you do you read sign language? I interpret sign language. I Bullshit. So what that means is she basically dark Christmas. I hint a theme. Yes. By Jeanette Winterstorm. So everyone, roll up your sleeves and prepare yourself for the Christmas themed spooky ghost story. The tale Love of it. Dark Christmas. 
Renting a remote house for the holidays sounds idyllic, but not to the stone gods Arthur, Jeanette Winter Winterson's haunting tale. This all starts by someone renting a house. So be careful with your holiday travel plans here. We had borrowed the house from a friend. None of us seemed to really know very well. High Fallen House stood on an eminence overlooking the sea. It was a square Victorian gentleman's residence. The large bay windows looked down through the pines towards the shore. Six stone steps led to the visitors, the visitor up to the double front door where the gothic belfry released a loud mournful clang deep into the distances of the house. Laurel lined the drive. The stable block was disused. The walled garden had been locked up in 1914 when the gardeners went to war. Only one had returned. I had been warned that the high brick wall enclosing the garden was unsafe. As I passed it slowly in the car, I saw a faded notice falling off the pink heeled door. Do not enter. I was the first to arrive. My friends were following by train and I was to collect them the next day and then we would settle down for Christmas. I had driven from Bristol and I was tired. There was a Christmas tree roped on the top of my 4x4 and a trunk load of provisions. We were not near any town, but the housekeeper had left stacks of wood to build a fire and I had brought a shepherd's pie and a bottle of wine for my first pint. The, Good call. Yes. The kitchen was cheerful enough once I had got the fire going and the radio playing while I unpacked our festive supplies. I checked my phone. No signal. Still, I knew the time of the train tomorrow, and it was a relief to feel that the world had gone away. I put my food in the oven to heat it up, poured a glass of wine, and went upstairs to find myself a bedroom. The first landing had three bedrooms leading off of it. Each had a moth-eaten rug, a metal bed, and a mahogany chest of drawers. At the far end of the landing was a second set of stairs up to the attic floor. I'm not romantic about maids, rooms, or nurseries, and there was something about that second set of stairs that made me hesitate. The landing was bright in the sudden ray of the late night, the late sun on a winter's afternoon, yet the light ended abruptly at the foot of the stairs, as though it couldn't go any further. That is sketchy. I didn't want to be near that set of stairs, so I chose the room at the front of the house. As I went to bring up my bag, the house bell started to ring. It's jerky, metallic hammers sounding somewhere in the guts of the house. I was surprised, but not alarmed. I expected the housekeeper. I opened the door. There was no one there. I went down the steps and looked around. I admit I was frightened. The night was clear and soundless. There was no car in the distance, no footsteps walking away. Determined to conquer my fear, I walked around a little. Then turning back to the house, I saw it. The bell wire ran along the side of the house under a sheltering gutter. Perhaps 30 or 40 bats were dangling upside down what the fuck? on the vibrating wire. The same number swooped and swerved in dark mass. Obviously, their movements on the wire had set off the bell. I like bats. Clever bats. Good. Now it's time for supper. What do you mean, like, clever? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So many questions there. An Does she lover, have obviously. bats? Okay. No. I like bats. Clever bats, of course. Like, I've raised bats. No, I think a person can appreciate wildlife. It's like looking out your window and seeing deer outside and being like, I like deer or I like squirrels. I like the lamp. I like blue water. <laughs> I can't with you tonight. I ate. I drank. I wondered why love is so hard and life is so short. I went to bed. The room was warmer now, and I was ready to sleep. The sound of the sea 
ebbed into the flow of my dreams. I woke from a dead sleep in the dead darkness to hear what? It sounded like a ball bearing or a marble rolling on the bare floor above my head. It rolled hard, then hit the wall. Then it rolled again in the other direction. This might not have mattered, except that the other direction was upwards. What? Things can come loose and roll downwards, but they cannot come loose and roll up. Unless someone. That thought was so unwelcoming that I dismissed it along with the law of gravity. <laughs> the attics were under the eaves where any kind of weather might get in. Weather or an animal. Remembering the bats, I pulled the covers up over my eyebrows and pretended not to listen. There it was again. A solid sounding rolling on a pause and then a roll. I waited for sleep, waiting for daylight. We are lucky, even the worst of us, because daylight does come. Then leave the lights on. Or call for help. Like, is there anyone there else? There was nobody sh there. They were the only person in the house. Uh, yeah. I was brooding that day. That 21st of December. The shortest day of the year. Yeah. Coffee. Coat on. Car keys. Shouldn't I just check the attic? The second set of mm. stairs was narrow. A servant's staircase. It led to a lath, L-A-T-H, and plaster corridor, barely a shoulder width wide. I started coughing. Breathing was difficult. Damp had dropped the plaster in thick, crumbling heaps on the floorboards. As below, there were three doors. Two were closed. The door to the room above my room was ajar. I made myself go forward. The room was under the eaves, as I had guessed. The floor was rough. There was no bed, only a washstand and a clothes rail. That surprised me. What surprised me was the nativity scene in the corner. Standing about two feet tall, it was more like a doll's house than a Christmas decoration. Inside the open fronted table stood the animals, mm. shepherds, a crib, Joseph, above the roof on a bit of a wire was a battered star. It was old, handmade, in a workmanlike but not craftsmanlike sort of way. The painted wood now rubbed and faded like pigments of time. I thought I would carry it downstairs and put it by our Christmas tree. It must have been made for the children then when there were children here. I stuffed my pockets with the figures and the animals and left quickly leaving the door open. I had to set off for the station. Stephen and Susie could help me with the rest later. As soon as I was out of the house, my lungs felt clear again. It must be the plaster dust. The drive to the station was along the coast road. Lonely and unyielding, the road turned in a series of blind bends and tight corners. I met no one and I saw no one. Gulls circled over the sea. The station itself was a simple shelter on a long single track. There were no information boards. I checked my phone again. No signal. At last, the train appeared distantly, distantly down the track. I was excited. Memories of visiting my father as a child when he was stationed at RAF RAF base gave me a rush of pleasure whenever I travel by train. The train slowed and halted. I watched the doors. It wasn't a big train, this branch line train, but none of the doors opened. I waved at the guard who came over. I'm meeting my friends. He shook his head. Train's empty. Next stop is the end of the line. I was confused. Had they got off at the earlier stop? I described them to the guard and he shook his head. I noticed strangers. They would have boarded at Carlisle ask, or asked me where to get off. Always do. Is there another train before tomorrow? Mm. One a day and that's your lot and more than anybody needs in a place like this. Where are you staying? 
High Fallen House, do you know it? Oh, I. We all know it. He looked as if he were about Red to flag. say something Red else. flag. Instead, he blew his whistle. The empty train pulled away, leaving me staring down the long track, watching the red lights like a warning. I needed to get a signal on my phone. I drove on past the station, following the steep hill, hoping that some height would connect me to the rest of the world. At the top of the hill, I stopped the car and I got out, pulling up the collar of my coat. The first snow hit my face, felt sharp and spiteful, like little bites. I looked out across the whitened bay. That must be Highland Fall, High Fallen House. But what's that? Two figures walking on the beach. Is it Stephen and Susie? Have they driven here after all? Then, as I strained my eyes against the deceit of distance, I realized that the second figure was much smaller than the first. They were walking purposefully towards the house. When I arrived back, it was nearly dark. I put on the lights, blew the fire into a blaze. There was no sign of the mysterious couple I had seen from the hill. Perhaps it had been the housekeeper and her daughter come to make sure that everything was all right? I had a telephone number for Mrs. Wormwood, but without a signal, I couldn't call her. Mm -hmm. The snow was thickening in windy swirls. I told myself to relax, have a whiskey. I leaned on the warm kitchen range with my whiskey in my hand, the wooden figures I had brought down from the attic were lying on the kitchen table. I should go out and look at the stable. I don't want to. I bounded up the first set of stairs using energy to force out unease. Mm -hmm. At my bedroom, I put on the light. That felt better. The second set of stairs stood in shadow at the end of the long landing. I felt that constriction in my lungs again. Why am I holding on to the handrail like an old man? I could see that the only light to the attic was at the top of the stairs. Because so <coughs> something is telling you something, like something's not right. Mm -hmm. I found the round brown bake light switch. A single bulb lit up reluctantly. The room was straight ahead. The door was closed. Had the one left it open? I turned the handle and stood in the doorway. The room dimly lit by the light from the stairs. Washstand, nativity, clothes rail. On the clothes rail was a child's dress. I hadn't noticed that before. I suppose I had been in a hurry. Pushing aside my misgivings, I went to purposefully. I went in purple person. <laughs> Welcome went, to being Thomas Aaron's, by the way. I went in <laughs> purposefully and bent down to pick up the wooden nativity. It was heavy, and I had just got to it secure in my arms when the light on the landing went out. Hmm. Hello? Who's there? There's someone breathing. What like the fuck? Like they can barely breathe. Not faint. Struggling for breath. I mustn't turn around because whoever it was, it was behind me. I stood Scream. Still. Fucking scream. I stood still for a minute, studying my nerve. Then I shuffled forward towards the edge of the light coming up from Smart. downstairs at the doorway. I heard a step behind me, lost my balance, and put my hand out to steady myself. My hand gripped something wet. What the, the clothes rail? It must be the dress. My heart was pounding. Don't panic. Ba bad wiring, strange house, darkness, aloneness. But you're not. Oh, shit. Back in the kitchen with whiskey, radio on, channel four, and pasta boiling, I examined the dress. It was for a small child, and it was hand-knitted. The wool was smelly and sopping. Hmm. I washed it out and left it hanging over the sink to drip. I guess there must be a hole in the roof, and the dress had been soaking up the rain for a long time. I ate my supper, tried to read told myself it had been nothing, nothing at all. It was only 8 p.m. I didn't want to go to bed, but the snow outside was like a quilt. I decided to arrange the nativity. Donkey, 
like sheep, camels, wisemen, shepherds, star, Joseph. <laughs> the crib was there, but it was empty. There was no Christ child, and there was no Mary. Had hmm. I dropped them in the dark room? No. I hadn't heard anything fall, and these wooden figures were six inches tall. Joseph was wearing a wooden tunic, but his wooden legs had painted Pooties? P-U-T-T-E-E. -E. I don't know how to pronounce it. Pooty. Pooty. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled off the tunic. Underneath wooden Joseph wore a painted uniform. First hmm. World War. Oh, boy. When I turned him around, I saw there was a gash in his back, like a stab wound. My phone beeped. I dropped Joseph, grabbed the phone. It was a text message from Susie, all in caps. Trying to call you, leaving tomorrow. I pressed call. Nothing. I tried to send a text. Nothing. But what did it matter? Suddenly, I felt relief and calm. They had been delayed. That was all. Tomorrow they would be here. That's a very big red flag if you can't have cell service. Yeah. I sat down again with the nativity. Perhaps the missing figures were inside. I put in my hands. I put my hands. Welcome to being tall. Well, the writing sucks during this section. I sat down again with the nativity. Perhaps the missing figures were inside. My fingers closed around a metal object in my pocket. It was a small iron key with a hoop top. Maybe it was the key to the attic door. What? Outside, snow had fallen. The sky had... <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, everyone. The sky had... The moon sped above the sea. I had gone to bed and I was deep asleep when I heard it clear above me. Footsteps. What? Pacing. Down the room. Hesitate. Turn. Return. I lay in bed, eyes staring blindly at the ceiling. Why do we open our eyes when we can't see anything? Mm -hmm. And what was it? I don't believe in ghosts. Well, maybe you should. <laughs> you start believing in ghosts. I wanted to put on the light, but what if the light didn't come on when I tried? Why, what would be worse? <laughs> to be in the darkness that I had Run. not chosen than darkness I was choosing? Are you in? But it would be worse. I sat up in bed and I pulled back the curtain a little. The moon had been so bright tonight. Surely there would be light. There was. Outside the house, hand in hand, stood the still and silent figures of a mother and child. What the fuck? I did not sleep again until daylight. And when I slept and woke again, it was almost midday and already the light was lowering. What the Hurrying to get coffee, I saw that the dress was gone. Leave the house. I had left it dripping over the sink, and it was gone. Get out of the house. Yes. I set off for the station. There was an air frost that had coated the trees in glittering white. It was beautiful and deathly. The world held in ice. On the road, there were no car tracks. No noise but the roar and drop of the sea. I moved slowly and saw no one. In the white, unmoving landscape, I wondered if there was anyone else left alive. At the station, I waited. I waited some time and, until the tr and waited and waited until the train whistled on the track. The train stopped. The guard got down and saw me. He shook his head. There's no one, he said. No one at all. I thought I would cry. I took out my mute phone, flashed up the message, trying to call you, leave tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The guard looked at it. Happen, happen it's you who should be leaving, he said. There's no more trains past Carlisle now to the 27th. Mm. Tomorrow was the last day and that's been canceled. Weather. 
I wrote down a number and gave it to the guard. Will you phone my friend and tell them I'm on the, I'm on the way home? On the slow journey back to High Fallen House, I filled my mind with my departure. It would be slow and dangerous to travel at night, but I could not consider another night alone. Mm -hmm. Smart, smart. All I had to do was manage 40 miles to Ink Barn. There was a pub and a guest house and remote, but normal life. The text message kept playing in my head. Had it really meant that I should leave? And why? Because Susie and Steven shouldn't come? Weather? Illness? It's all a guessing game. The fact is I have to go. Mm -hmm. The house seemed subdued when I returned. I had left the lights on and I went straight upstairs to pack my bag. At once I saw that the light to the attic was on. I paused. Took a deep breath. Of course it's on. I never switched it off. That proves it's a wiring fault. I must tell the house housekeeper. I packed my bag. I threw the food inside a box and put everything back in the car. I had the whiskey in the front, a blanket I stole from the bed, and I made a hot water bottle just in case. It was only 5 o'clock. At worst, I'd be at my location by 9 p.m. I got in the car and I turned the key. The radio came on for a second and then died. The ignition clicked. And clicked, I knew the battery was flat. Two hours ago at the station, the car started the first time. Even if I had left the lights on, but I hadn't left the lights on. A cold panic hit me. Why did they want her there? I took a swig of whiskey. I couldn't sleep in the car all night. I'd die. I don't want to die. Really? What, 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 you would die in the car? It's too cold. It's like below freezing. Fucking Christ, you're right. About that. That's okay. why they got a warm water bottle in case they like emergencies. Back in the house, I wondered what I was going to do all night. I must not fall asleep. I had noticed some old books and volumes when I had explored downstairs yesterday, assorted the dusty adventure stories and tales of empire. As I sorted through them, I came across a faded velvet photograph album. In the cold, deserted sitting room, I began to discover the past. High Fallen House, 1910. The women in the long skirts with miraculous waists. The men in the shooting tweeds. The stable boys in waistcoats. The gardening boys wearing flat caps. <laughs> the maids in starched aprons. And here they are again in their Sunday best. A wedding photograph. Joseph and Mary Locke, 1912. Mm. He was a gardener, she was a maid in the back of the album. Loose and unsorted were further photographs and newspaper cuttings. 1914, the men in uniform, there was Joseph. I took the album back into the kitchen and put it next to my wooden soldier. I had him set up all night. I had on my coat and scarf already. I propped myself up two chairs by the wood fire and dozed and waited and waited and dozed. It was perhaps two o'clock when I heard a child crying. Not a child mm -hmm. who had scraped his knee or lost a toy, but an abandoned child. A child whose voice is his last hold on life. A child whose cries has no has known that no one will come. That is oddly specific to actually recognize from her voice. <laughs> the sound was not above me on the second floor, but the third. I knew where it was coming from. I put my hands over my ears and my head between my knees. I could not shut out the sound. A locked up child, a hungry child, a child who is cold and wet and frightened. Twice I got up and went to the door. Twice I sat down again. The crying stopped. Silence. A dreadful silence. I raised my head. Footsteps were coming down the stairs, not one foot in front of the other, but one foot was dragging slightly. Wait, what? Then the other joining it, steadying, stepping again. At the bottom of the stairs, the footsteps paused. Then they did what I knew they would do, with all the terror in my body. 
the footsteps came towards the kitchen door. Mm. Whatever was out there was standing 12 feet away on the other side of the door. Let's do something. Come on. I stood behind the table and picked up a knife. The Good. door swung open with a violent force that rammed the brass doorknob into the plaster of the wall. Wind and snow blew into the kitchen, whirling up the photographs and cuttings on the table. Mm. I saw that the front door itself was wide open, the entrance hall like a wind tunnel. Holding the knife, I went forward into the hall to shut the door. The pendant metal lantern that hung from the ceiling was swinging wildly on its long chain. A sudden gust lurched it forward like a child swinging pushed swing to push too high. It fell back and forth against the large semicircular fanlight over the front door. The fanlight shattered and fell round my shoulders in sharp in shards of sharp rain. Oh shit. Flicker, buzz, darkness. The house lights went out. Fucking God, that's not good. No wind. No cries. Silence again. Glass hit in the snow-lit hall. I walked out of the front door and into the night at the drive. I turned left and I saw them, the mother and the child. The child was wearing the woolen dress. Oh, she sure. had no shoes. What? She, sh she held up her arms piteously to her mother who stood like stone I ran forward I grabbed the child in my arms he was no child I had fallen face down into the snow help me that's not my voice I'm on my feet again the mother is ahead of me I follow her she's going towards the war the, the walled garden she seems to pass through the door leaving me on the other side that sign again do not enter mm. I tried the rusty hoop handle. It broke off, taking a piece of door with it. I kicked the door open. It fell off its hinges. The ruined and abandoned garden lay before me. A walled garden of one acre used to feed 20 people, but that was a long time ago. There were footprints in the snow. I followed them. They led me to the small shelter, its roof patched up from the use of time. There was no door, but the inside seemed dry and sound. There was a tear-off calendar still on the wall. 22 Damn. December 1916. Wow. I put my hand in my pocket and realized that the key from the nativity was still there. At the same time, I heard a chair scrape on the floor in the room beyond. I had no fear anymore. As the body first shivers and then numbs with cold, my feelings were frozen. I was moving through shadows as in the room beyond, there was a low fire lit in a tiny tin fireplace. On either side of the fire sat the mother and child. The child's, child was absorbed, playing with a marble. Her bare feet were blue, but she did not seem to feel the cold any more than I did. Oh no, that's not good. Are we dead then? The woman with the shawl over her head looked at me with deep, expressionless eyes. I recognized her. It was Mary Locke. She nodded at me, or at something mm. other than me in some other time. I don't know. Her gaze went to a tall cupboard. I knew that my key fitted this cupboard and that I must open it. So I did. You better do it fast. A dusty uniform fell out, crumpling like a puppet. The uniform was not quite empty of its occupant. The back of the faded wool jacket had a long slash where the lungs would have been. Oh my god. I looked at the knife in my hand. Open the door. Are you in there? Open the door. I woke to blinding white. Where am I? Something's rocking. It's the car. I'm in my car. A heavy glove was brushing off the snow. I sat up, found my keys, pressed the unlock button. It was morning. Outside was the guard from the train and a woman who announced herself as Mrs. Wormwood. Fine mess you have you've made here, she said. We went into the kitchen. I was shivering so much that Mrs. Wormwood relented and began to make coffee. Alfie fetched me, she said, after he spoke with your friends. 
There's a body, I said. It's in the walled garden. Is that where it is, said Mrs. Wormwood. At Christmas, mm. 1914, Joseph Locke had gone to war. But before he left for Flanders, he had made a nativity scene for his little girl. When he came back in 1916, he'd been gassed. They heard him climbing the stairs, gasping for breath through froth-corrupted lungs. His mind had gone, they said. At night in the attic where he slept with his wife and his child, he leaned vacantly against the wall, rolling the child's marbles up and down, down and up, pacing, <coughs> pacing, pacing. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I'm getting here on my cold. Um, interesting thing there for everyone to know. This talks about World War One, Flanders Field, is the Battle of the Somme that happened, which was the worst day the British Empire ever had in casualties. They lost 60,000 plus men in one day. And when they say gas, it's called mustard gas or um, we'll just go with mustard gas because it gets very gruesome. And it really affects the lungs and the brain. Mm. So this really is historically accurate too, by the way, that he went to Flanders and when he came back, Flanders Fields, where the poppies grow. Mm -hmm. Flanders Fields, where our lads now grow. Continue. So he would pace and pace all night long. One night just before Christmas, he strangled his wife and daughter. <gasps> He left them for dead in the bed and went out, but his wife was not dead. Oh my God. She followed him. In the morning, they found her sitting by the nativity, her dress dark, covered with blood, his finger marks livid on her throat. She was singing a lullaby and pushing the point of the knife into the back of the wooden figure. Mm. Joseph was never found. Are you going to call the police, I said? <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm good. <laughs> Are you going to call the police, I said? What for, said Mrs. Wormwood. Let the dead bury the dead. Alfie the guard went out to see me to my car. It started the first time. The exhaust blew in the white air. I left them clearing up and was about... I left them clearing up and was about to set off when I remembered I had left my radio in the kitchen. I went back inside. The kitchen was empty. I could hear the two of them in the attic. I picked up the radio. The nativity was on the table as I had left it. But it wasn't as I had left it. Joseph was there. And the animals. And the shepherds. And the worn out star. And in the center was the crib. Next to the crib were the wooden figures of a mother and a child. Oh my God. And this was the tale of the dark what does that mean? I think that they had been missing. They found peace? Yes. I mean, that's so fucking sad because you think about this guy that, like, pre literally went through, like, a horrific thing. Right. And he's broken. Right. But maybe and he obviously had PTSD. He probably didn't think that he was killing his wife and his child. He probably mm -hmm. thought that he was, like fighting for his life because he was having a PTSD, like, reliving a moment in a war. In fact, it's just so fucking sad. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, shit. God damn it. Crazy sad. But again, the trauma, mm. the trauma, trauma of death yeah. leaves an imprint in, you know, in, you know, in reality. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, people like us can actually see spirits and things like that because of again like the serious horrible things that happen in life yeah. that's what i'm trying to say it's 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 like 12 o'clock in the morning but that that that's a really good story that's a fantastic story by the way thank you um and so that really that really starts off our christmas festivities yeah our kicks holiday, off our christmas yeah. season our holiday season this december mm -hmm. Tess, thank you so much. We really appreciate the present. It was really amazing. We're just going to leave it at that. But thank you so much for the... the it was actually. a wonderful surprise. It we really are, was. We are... Our hearts are warm. Since she is one of our super fans. So Absolutely. shout out. We really appreciate you. And um, yeah, please like, 
comment. Let us know if you like this idea of doing Christmas. If you like us to tra- change up what we're doing. We are changing it up. So let so, us know if you like it. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know. Uh, please reach out to us at spirits and ghost stories at gmail.com or you can talk to us on Facebook or Instagram or any of the other social media handles. But Carly, this is a great start into the festivities of Christmas. My name is Thomas Aarons. I'm Carly Bird. This has been Spirits and Ghost Stories. Have a wonderful holiday season, and we'll see you next week, guys. Bye. Bye.